Luke 16, 11 and 12. So if you have not been trustworthy, anybody be able to finish that? In handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Okay? So I'm not even going to ask you if you have said, oh, I have all these insights from this, since you don't remember what it was. We're going to pray and we're going to get started. Today we're thinking about greatness in the kingdom. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, that there should even be the possibility that one of us in this room should be great in the kingdom of heaven is just mind-bending. And it's all because of your grace in Jesus. So Lord, we need to understand what that means, what the kingdom is, what greatness is in it, and how we get there. So help us listen to our Lord and his teaching well. Give us insights and grace to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a question for you, and I just want your opinion. And we don't have to pass the microphone out. Just, just shout what you think. Who is the greatest athlete of all time? What? Athlete or sports player would be fine. <laughs> Joe Montana? Okay. He, he was a good football player. What? Michael Jordan was pretty good, yeah. Any others? Any other ideas? What's your favorite sports player? Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson, yep. He was good. Larry Bird. These people are Why old. are we stuck on... There's baseball, <laughs> you know. Nobody thinks of baseball. I oh, Jared Jeter. <laughs> all right, what about... Who's the greatest musician of all time? S musician, singer, composer. Andrew. Don't say Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> <laughs> Bocelli, okay. Uh, Michael Johann W. Smith. Sebastian okay. Bach is the, the... Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what about this? Who's the greatest president of all time? United States president. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. George Washington. Ronald Reagan. George Washington. Okay. All right. Now here's the question. How did you come up with your reasons for why these people are the greatest. Let's take uh, the sport, sports players. Okay, so you think these people are, are great because of what they put into the game, not because of how oh, talented they are. Obedience reminds me of Reggie Jackson. So Reggie Jackson came into the league playing for Baltimore. He gets on first base. Reggie is at his first year in the league, super fast. His coach has told him, his manager, you do not steal unless you get a sign. And he's looking at the pitcher and he's like, I can totally steal. There is no way this guy's going to get me. So he's looking over, waiting for a sign. He's not, he's not getting the sign. So he decides I'm doing it anyway. And he steals second. He slides in. He jumps up. The throw's way late. He looks around like... The manager was not real... It was Earl Weaver. Was not real happy with him. And afterwards, he said, what were you doing? You know, don't pull a stunt like that again. And Reggie's like, I didn't have any trouble. And he said, look, because the guy after you is batting third and has this history of hitting this pitcher over and over again. He's like 700% on this pitcher. I needed him to bat. You stole the base. They walked him and struck out the next guy because he's had a terrible history with this pitcher. See what you did? You know, and so, yeah, there's greatness. Reggie Jackson was great. 
but he wasn't obedient, was he? <laughs> so we're talking about greatness, what makes a person great. And we live in a culture that's obsessed with greatness. I mean, if you turn on ESPN, every two weeks there's the who's the greatest of all time football player, Tom Brady or this person, who's the greatest basketball player, the GOAT, right. And even, you know, when it doesn't come to sports, the who has the highest job title? You know, who, who's going to get the top job in whatever company? Um, even in school, you know, what's, who's get the first string? Who, who's going to sit first chair in, in the band? Who's valedictorian, right? Why are we intrigued by other people's greatness? Why are we so desirous of our own? I think it's because great people are held in higher esteem. They're liked more. They have whatever they want. And in short, we want the same. We want to be little gods ruling over our own little world. It's interesting. Why do we even care who the goat is? We're not you understand football players. Goat, the, right? Sorry, the greatest of all time. Who do we, why do we care? What do we have to do with it? Um, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, you know, hit your wagon to a star. We get a little bit of their glory because somehow we're connected with them because we like them, right? Or we talk about them. We think they're the greatest. That's true. <laughs> yeah, we, we could actually go. But who would go? I don't know. You know, it's not just American culture that, that's obsessed with greatness. This is human nature. It's been human nature from the beginning. One of the great things about Jesus is that he has a way of turning the way we think upside down. Of saying, hey, you think this way, but it's actually the opposite. He makes us realize it's not wrong to seek greatness. Human beings were made to be great, but true greatness is not what we thought it was. And he surprises us many times in the Gospels. I'm just going to share three times where he, he shares with us what true greatness actually looks like. This is Mark 10, and we'll, we'll go more in, deep, uh, in depth with these verses. Mark 10, 10 verse 43 and 44. This is what he tells his disciples. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. This is Matthew 18, verse 3 and 4. I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this, little, like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then Luke chapter 9, verse 48. For it's the one who is least among you who is the greatest. The one who is least among you is the greatest. What would you say, and we, don't, we won't need you to use the mic for this. You say it, I'll repeat it so that anybody watching online can hear. But what would you say are the markers of greatness in the world? As far as the world's concerned, what are the markers of greatness? Wealth. Power, status, Twitter followers, name recognition. We were talking about, as we were writing this lesson, we were talking about how there's, um, you know, 21-year-olds 20, who are nobody, but they get on social media, and they're now called influencers, and they have millions of people watching their little, their little videos. It's crazy. How about beauty? Our world, we love beauty. I think we're designed to love beauty. That people who are beautiful get treated better than, I won't say than you, than me. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the markers of greatness in God's kingdom? Humility. Obedience. <laughs> S 
service. You know, the, and I think this is true. Here's, here's a crossover. Name recognition is one of the markers of greatness in the kingdom. But it's not that other people know your name. It's that God knows your name. So, uh, I have called you by name, Isaiah 43. You are mine. And that great passage in Galatians where Paul says, now that you've come to know God, and then he stops mid-sentence and says, or rather, are known by him. Greatness in the kingdom has to do with God knowing us. Sometimes we think that people are great because they have great gifts. But giftedness is not a sign of greatness. And some people have just enormous intelligence. They have remarkable leadership gifts. They're fantastic speakers. But greatness in the kingdom doesn't have to do with the gifts. They're Not even spiritual gifts. Yeah, not even spiritual gifts. They're gifts from God. He's the one who gives them. People are great in the degree that they resemble Jesus. Greatness is being like Jesus. So some of the great in the kingdom of heaven are people we don't know. The first really shall be last, and the last really shall be first. Churches get in trouble when they confuse the greatness of the world with the greatness of the kingdom. And then they do dumb things. So they say, oh, we need him on the board because he makes all this money. Or he has a PhD. She has a PhD. She should be the head of our education department. Or whatever. So if you noticed how when some famous celebrity becomes a Christian, we are all, oh, he's a Christian. And sometimes his life is like, mm. There's all kinds of stuff in his life that should just scare us to death, but, oh, no, he's a Christian, and so, you know, we want to go to that church where this guy goes, and, uh, you know. Have the person speak, <clears throat> at the, at whatever. So, I've read in, in a Guidepost magazine some years ago, Denzel Washington's a Christian. Wonderful. I think Denzel Washington is this incredible actor, probably a wonderful guy and everything else, but... That doesn't make him great in the kingdom of heaven. Maybe he is, but not by the standards of the world. Sometimes being great in the world is an obstacle to being great in the kingdom of heaven. So St. Paul says to the Corinthians, remember what you were. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. There are some, I think, who have been great in the world and great in the kingdom simultaneously, but I don't think there have been many. I think it's dangerous. I think um, young people sometimes think this way. I'm going to become great in the world so that I can do great things for God. You know, I'm going to make lots of money, and so I can give for the kingdom, and, and I'm going to, you know, become this famous singer or whatever. What usually happens to those people? They get caught up in that greatness, don't they? And sometimes it's hard to get out. It's the people who have lived their lives to be great for God. And sometimes, somehow, they find themselves great in the world. Who, and God makes that happen. And God's the one who For his that. purpose. Yeah. yeah. So... We're talking about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, great in the kingdom of heaven. Until we have some grasp of what the kingdom of heaven is, this is not going to connect with us. So we have to understand the kingdom. Jesus talks about being great in the kingdom. He's not talking about being, not specifically talking about being important in the afterlife. The kingdom of heaven is not the same as heaven, where God lives and from whence he reigns where we'll go when we die. Nor is he talking about being, exactly talking about being special. Everyone in, everyone in the kingdom is special. Michael, can you find my mic and turn me up just a little bit? Oh, he's good. Okay. 
Um, so Brian's got the, the iPad downstairs, so we're good. Um, everybody in the kingdom is special, but some will be great and some will be least in the kingdom of heaven, according to Jesus. So what is the kingdom? So before we understand greatness in it, we need to understand what the kingdom is. The kingdom of heaven is the realm where what the king wants done is done. The kingdom of heaven is the realm where what the king wants done is done. The citizens of the kingdom are those who live under the rule and reign of the king. The kingdom has come near because of Jesus, and that changed everything. It changes who is blessed. It changes what constitutes greatness because the kingdom has come near. In the world, the blessed are rich, beautiful, powerful. The great are those who get their way. But that's changed because the kingdom of God has come near. So let me give you an illustration. Uh, you're in Berlin, 1943. Some, some German general and his staff are considered blessed. They are great. They are great because England is on its heels and the Americans haven't entered the war. Well, they had entered the war, but they haven't come to Normandy yet. The poor French farmer, the Polish factory worker, they're not blessed. They're not great. They may even consider themselves cursed. The general gets whatever he wants. The Jew gets Auschwitz. So then the Allies invade. June 6th, D-Day. Belgium is freed. They cross German lines. They pass into Nuremberg, where my aunt grew up. Into Dresden. They take positions outside of Berlin. Who's blessed then? Is it the general? Or is it the French farmer? See, the tables have been turned. The order inverted. The world has turned upside down. Is it? And it's because the kingdom has come near. So, we read in scripture that Jesus speaking, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the persecuted. Why is that? It's because those things are good. Hardship is good. Mourning is good. No, it's because the kingdom has come. And they can enter the kingdom. The reason the rich and well-fed and famous are cursed, this is in Luke's um, version of the Beatitudes, is not that Monty, money and plenty and fame are bad in themselves but because the kingdom has come near and the people that have those things don't want anything to do with it. They don't want God to come any more than the Germans wanted the allies to come. But they're going to get the kingdom whether they want it or not. What Jesus says, this Luke 6, verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. The tables are, the tables are being turned, yeah. So, kingdom life is different than life in the world. The kingdoms come near, but we have to understand the kingdom has not been consummated yet, fulfilled. The Allies have reached Paris, but the French Free France has not been, the government has not been set up yet. So, in the biblical paradigm of history, there are two ages, one of which is evil, the present evil age, and has the upper hand right now, and one in which God reigns, and the two separated by the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is the time when God comes to be present among his people and to reign among them. When God did come and was present among his people, Jesus spoke of it as the day of visitation, they didn't recognize it. But you have not recognized the day of your visitation. They killed the Son of God but God raised him from the dead. We are living right now in the overlap time between the invasion and the consummation of the kingdom. We are servants of the king. 
We acknowledge only Jesus as Lord. We are agents of the kingdom, but we're, we are agents in a territory that does not recognize his authority. Within the kingdom, things are different. In this colony of the kingdom, there's a way to live in the kingdom that differs from the way people live in the rest of the world. There's a lifestyle of the kingdom. My dad had a friend who was an Englishman who had been imprisoned by the Japanese in the Philippines and suffered a great deal. Um, and he, he, was a, he wasn't a, a British soldier. He was a British expat living in the Philippines when the Japanese invaded. But he was imprisoned along with British servicemen. One of the interesting things about what happened in where he was is that the Brits, after some confusion and disorder and difficulty, decided to keep up British customs, even in a prisoner of war camp. So they started saluting officers again. They met uniform regulations. If they still had a tie, they were supposed to wear that tie. They were supposed to shave if they were able to shave. And some of them, when it was possible, even had tea or sat down at tea time like they were going to have tea because they were English. They were going to live as citizens of England no matter how the people around them lived. That's us. The people around us are not going to understand us. They're not going to live by the customs of the kingdom of God. They're not going to be great in the kingdom of God or even care about that, but we do. We live within the kingdom of God. So Matthew, uh, we'll get to Matthew 18 later, but Mark 10, we'll start there, talks about what is greatness in the kingdom. One of the things that the disciples had such difficulty understanding is that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. They were expecting him to bring in a kingdom, for sure, and they were looking forward to it. But they thought, this is a kingdom that works like other kingdoms work, right? Jesus is going to be the king, and we're going to be the top guys. Let's, if you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 10. We're going to start in verse uh, 32. I won't read it all, but I'll just explain what's going on. So three times in Mark, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10, Jesus says the same thing to his 12 disciples. He says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and the leaders and the chief priests are going to take me, and they're going to kill me, and on the third day, I will rise again. He tells them this three times, right? The last time, they were on their way to Jerusalem. So there's this great uh, pilgrimage festival every year. On Passover, people pass through the great city of Jericho, and there's this celebration, and then they start climbing the mountains up to get to Jerusalem. They've passed through Jericho with great celebration because everybody, there's, there's huge crowds following Jesus, and they're all following him up this mountain, this great celebration, and they, everyone's wondering what's going to happen because Passover was historically the time when God freed his people through Moses. It was also historically the time that Jewish rebels raised um, coups within the empire. Yes, over and over again, even in, in Pilate's time. Pilate was famous for putting down several coups and riots and things during Passover. So at Passover, the Roman procurator would send troops into Jerusalem prior to Passover and then after Passover time, the number of troops on the streets would just increase many fold to keep this kind of thing from happening. And so the Jews absolutely hated Pilate. He would, he was, there's one story about him sending in uh, soldiers that were dressed in common clothes to stand behind Jewish people in case they started getting rowdy and they had knives to stab them in the back. So people hated Pilate, he hated the Jews, he hated to give them what they wanted it was not a good relationship. Anyway, they're on the mountain. They're climbing up the mountain. And it says in verse 32 that Jesus was leading, his, leading the way. His disciples were astonished and the people were afraid. You know, what was going to happen? Was Jesus going to take over? 
you know, what would there be this huge rebellion? Were they going to be a part of it? Whose side would they join? Might they die in a few days when they go up to, to Jerusalem? And by the way, what does Jesus do when he gets there? He goes into the temple and he takes over the temple for a whole day. This was the sign. <laughs> He's taking control. The temple is the heart of Judaism. And Jesus is taking control of it. And then he leaves. Imagine what the disciples thought. What is going on? So, after thousands of years, I mean, it had been, well, it had been 1,500 years since Moses. God's anointed Messiah had finally come. Thousands of people would, would join him, and they would fight to win their freedom against the Romans. And the disciples were hoping for this too, but you know why? It wasn't just because they would get freedom. They thought, if Jesus is in charge... Who's he going to make his, his government officials? Right? Obviously, they were thinking, you know, we're his best friends. We've been with him all along. He's going to give us important positions in the kingdom. We might take, you know, different parts of Israel like Herod's sons took different parts of Israel. Right? And then we might, have, we might be kings ourselves. Jesus knew their temptation. He knew their false hoops, hopes. He knew what they were thinking. And so as they're, they're doing this, this great pilgrimage up the mountain, he stops everybody. Thousands of people, he says, we're going to take a rest on the road, and he takes his 12 disciples aside. And he told them for the third time, don't get your hopes up. We're going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to capture me and kill me, and then I'll rise again. It went in one ear and right out the other, because you know what happened Right after he said that, James and John come up and they say, Jesus, when you enter your kingdom, um, can we sit on your right hand and one of us sit on your left hand? In other words, when you take the throne and you're the, the ruler and you have all this kingdom authority, right? Can we, can we have the second and the third most important roles in the kingdom? Do you think the other disciples were happy when they heard about that? They were so upset. And was it because James and John were just insolent and they shouldn't ask such questions? No. It's because they wanted the second and the third positions in the kingdom. They were fighting with each other, right? I can just see the exasperation, the, the frustration on Jesus' face. He reminded them, James and John, that he had a cup to drink. In other words, he had a baptism to undergo. He had to die on the cross. And he said, can you drink that cup? Can you undergo that baptism? And I think they probably had no idea what he was talking about because they said, yeah, we can. We can do it too, right? We'll, we'll undergo things. I think they thought it's going to be hard, but we'll come out on the other side. And just by the way, on the eve of the crucifixion, the night they celebrated Passover, the disciples are still arguing about who's going to be top dog. So this is the context in which Jesus shares uh, some of his most brilliant insight about what it means to be great and what it looks like to be great in the kingdom. So this is verse, um, this is verse 41. Jesus calls them together. Verse 42. He called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So he didn't say you're not going to be great in the kingdom. He said it's not going to work like other kingdoms. Not so with you. Instead, verse 43, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, isn't this amazing? Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I said earlier, Jesus is always turning our world upside down with his words. Isn't he? It's so opposite of how we think things go and how they work. But if St. Peter and, and St. John and, and St. James, if St. Matthew and all these other people had to have their heads screwed on straight, we probably do too, right? We, we forget, and we start thinking the way that the world thinks. 
This is the lesson Jesus is trying to teach us. The great ones of this world might be the ones with high status. They might be the best at things, the richest. They might get all the praise, all the attention, and have whatever they desire. But in God's kingdom, which is going to come and which is going to take over and change everything, the great ones are those who have chosen to be lowly, who are humble and who live to serve others. That's what it looks like to be great in God's kingdom. In this kingdom, even the king, Jesus himself, does not come to, ser- to be served, but to serve, to give his life for other people. He's been given all the authority in heaven, all the authority on earth, and what does he do with it? Does he lord it over like the Gentiles do? No, he humbles himself and he serves others. That's what greatness looks like. But why? Why is a servant the greatest? He says this is how it works in in God's kingdom. The servant is the great one. Why? Most servants, most servants in those days, and by the way, servant and slave in Greek are the same word. Most slaves had no authority. They had no rights, they weren't noticed, they weren't thanked, they were never praised. So why does Jesus say that the one who takes that role is the greatest? Jesus is actually making a pretty obvious statement. Who is really great? Is it the guy who lives to make him, you know, to get as much pleasure as possible? Is it the guy who makes his life easy and pleasurable? Or is it the guy who gives everything, including his own life, for the sake of God and others, who's really great? The last one, a servant. A a servant is really great. And the one who makes himself a servant to others is the greatest because real service is nothing but love. And love is the mark of greatness in the kingdom. Right? So no wonder Jesus was so insistent that we needed to be servants. It wasn't just here that he said those things. We need to be careful that we're not running after the wrong kind of greatness in this life. If we live to become great in this world, we will end up being last in God's eternal kingdom. Because remember what he says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Almost everyone in this world is caught up in the pursuit of the, either the wrong kind of greatness or pleasure or, you know, selfishness, right? It's easy to fall back into that way of thinking unless we make Jesus our constant study. That's we're constantly coming back to him and saying, this is what he's like. I was made to be great like he is great, right? He, he is um, the, the term I used before. The, Jesus is the goat, of everything, right? And we're, we're called to be like him. Let's look at Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. Let me set the stage for this. The disciples had seen more and more evidence that Jesus really is the Messiah they've been waiting for. Everybody's been waiting for him. He's done these incredible things. He's raised people from the dead. They know the kingdom of God is drawn near in him, and it's right around the corner. In fact, on on the night he was betrayed, he said, I'll not drink of the fruit of this vine again until the kingdom of God is fulfilled. You know what they thought? They thought he was saying, by next Passover, it's done. The kingdom of God has arrived. The disciples find themselves in the middle of this. It's exciting. They're special. They're a part of the most important moment in history. And they reacted to that with self-seeking pride. So this is verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's interesting, if you look at this in the original language, the adjective here 
does not mean greatest but greater. It's comparative. Right. Who, who is, they're wondering, who is the top dog? Picture the situation. Disciples are excited. They think the war is going to start. It's, everything's ready right now. They ask who's going to be the greater of us? Who's going to be the second in command? Jesus then calls a little child. It's verse 2. And had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They were set on greatness in the terms of the world. And that's understandable. We're all raised that way. We're raised to compare ourselves to everybody else. Notice in verse 3, I don't know if you picked this up, Jesus did not say, unless you change, and, and in Greek, that it's just the word turn, strafo. Unless you turn, but it's passive voice, unless you are turned, God does the turning. But we need to cooperate with him. Unless you're turned, he doesn't say you'll not be great in the kingdom of heaven. He says you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So, this turning is an important thing. And become like little children. So Jesus chooses a child as the symbol of humility. Fenton says, not because a child is humble, most of them are not, but because a child has no status. People are not spontaneously like little children. Jesus said, unless you turn and become like little children, that is not something that just happens to us. We don't do that spontaneously or naturally. There must be an act of turning away from something, unless you turn, and humbling oneself. So, this time we'll use the mic, if you would. Can you share with us why, um, in what way a child is humble. What is it about the child that Jesus is saying, become like this child? What is it about children? Yesterday at the men's breakfast, I talked about who I was when I was five years old. And I was this sweet little boy, and the, boy, and <clears throat> the guys laughed, and they, it was was. <laughs> and I, I I really, truly was, and I remember being that way. And then I asked, what happened to me between then and, say, 21 that made me change? I think it fits in with this. I felt loved. I felt secure. I was, I was under my mommy and daddy, and I didn't have all these outside threats. I hadn't been attacked. And so I, I sometimes think we need to see this humility, and we talked about it last week at Go Deep, about being properly aligned under God. So all this humility stuff, I'll just tell you how I think in my carnal mind, <laughs> which I st still struggle with. Okay, I mean, who here has, who here is, this is the first time you've heard you got to be a servant, you got to be the least. None of us, we all know this, don't we? So what is it that makes us struggle with this? Because you know what? Okay, I'm going to just be really humble. Colossians 2 addresses this with this false humility. So I'm going to start doing all this rule following, and I'm going to get the attaboys from people by, wow, look at him. He's giving up this. He doesn't have that. He doesn't listen to that. He doesn't drink this. You <laughs> just keep going on. So I don't think it's so much these acts of what the world defines as humility, it's that getting property all, properly aligned under the head and being connected to that and just feeling loved and safe. And I have nobody to impress in a proper way, not like Reggie Jackson. Yeah, so that's children are like that. Um, there's a back where Beth is. 
children are under their parents and they're safe there and yeah. I love when my kids um, are proud of their dad <laughs> and I think that's like our, an example of us with our father when mm. their status is in their relationship to us, you know, as their parents. That's what they, who they are. Good. Um, one of my favorite songs right now is called Will You Be a Child? Um, and one of the lines just says, will you be a child? Sit at his feet and look up. Will you be a child? And then the, the bridge is, um, when you're a child, your dad can do anything. When you're a child, nothing's impossible. You know, I, as a child, you do believe your dad can literally do anything. And if our dads can do anything, how much more can our actual Heavenly Father do? So, Good. I think also as a child, they're like sponges and they just want to learn. And that's what we should go to the Lord as wanting to learn whatever it is he has for us. A child, have you ever noticed... Until they reach a certain age, they don't try to cast an image of themselves for other people to see. They don't think about their self-image. Um, I, I think that's true. A child's dependent. He knows he's dependent. He doesn't go and say, oh, I've got to work for a living today. I've got to make all this money so that I'll have food to eat. He trusts that his dad will take care of him and his mom. And this is interesting. Maybe this is in mind. Have you ever noticed that children don't look down on others until they're taught to do so? You know, they've got this homeliest little friend who has no money in the world and wears ragged clothes and they don't even notice. I, I think it's easy for kids to love until the world system teaches them not to. Whoever humbles himself like this child... Not that the child humbles himself, but to become like a child. How do you do that? You turn away from pursuing worldly greatness. You cannot pursue worldly greatness and do this. That doesn't... So I think the athletes about whom I've been most impressed over the years are the people who love the game. They play it because they love it, and they can do things in that moment they'll never do when they're trying to get people to look at them. This, this sounds bad, but... I remember when Kobe Bryant was pushing to try to get the season's, single season scoring record. You know what? It wasn't pretty. The man of en enormous talent, uh, just incredible. But when it became about me getting the scoring record, that's not good. And you're not as good as you could be. You need to stop thinking about outcomes because you're not in control. I can't make this. It's not up to me to make it happen. I entrust this to the Lord. My father, he'll take care of it. I just do what I'm supposed to do. Man, what a difference that makes. Then you can be like David of Psalm 133, who is content like a little child. Yep. 131. Uh, yeah, we'll just stop there. Give us the close would you real fast yeah my my favorite c.s lewis book is the great divorce Have any of you read that before so in the great divorce the main character is in hell and he goes to heaven and he kind of sees what things are like in heaven what people are like is more what it's about and um the the main character sees this great heavenly procession going by and there's uh there's this woman at the head of the procession and there's angels following her and just like you know, everyone's celebrating her, and she's just walking. He says, oh, my goodness, is that? And he's talking to his companion there, and his companion says, no, that's not, that's not Mary. He thinks it's like Mother Mary, you know, is just great. No, that's a person you've never heard of, probably. Her name was Sarah Smith on Earth, and she lived a quiet life. She took care of boys and girls and animals that needed her, and this is how she turned out as one of the greats in heaven. She's one of the great ones, he says. And his guide says to him, you've heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. And as far as the world was concerned, this Sarah Smith, 
person was a nobody, but as far as God was concerned, as far as the angels were concerned, she was one of the great ones. God has created us. He's destined us for greatness. But it's a different kind of greatness than the things that people seek. And it's a greatness that most people would never be interested in. They would never want it. But it's the kind of greatness that can satisfy us. We can be happy with the greatness that God gives. We can never be happy with the kind of greatness that the world affords. Michelle, do we have time for Michelle's comment? Yeah. Hey, I just wanted to say that our heaven or our earthly parents, they're all about getting us out on our own and taking care of ourselves. And then we're freaking out trying to use our gifts to take care of ourselves and be all of these things that society or our parents want us to be. And God, he wants to be our parent all the time. He's not going to kick us out. He wants us to depend on him all throughout our lives, no matter how old we are. And that's hard to remember, but God's not going to kick us out of the house, and he wants us always to be relying on him, just like if you read through the Old Testament. It's please come back to me, and people just keep wandering away from him, and he's totally the opposite of most earthly parents.